Wesley Workman. Uh, I work at um, Battery. It's one of the Sensi Tech companies in town. Um, we're downtown. Um, I've been in Ember for a long time, even since it was before it was be called. Since before it was called Ember. Um, so feel free to ask any questions during this talk. Uh, feel free to butt in at any time. It's just a small crowd, so pretty informal. Um, and today I'm going to talk about file uploads. I don't know. Are you recording? Should I get started? Yeah, you're good. Okay, cool. Um, so if you, I've demoed our app a couple of times, a couple of different people in the room, some people have seen it, some people haven't. Basically, uh, the long story, the too long didn't read, is uh, we're like kind of an enterprise Pinterest app in one respect. Um, we allow lots of collection of files in, in different forms. Um, and so uploading to our app is a critical part um, of our workflow. And we recently overhauled how we uploaded files to the app uh, to support much larger files. We added native video support. Um, so I spent. God, two or three weeks, uh, write, writing and rewriting and re-rewriting how files worked, um, file uploads worked in Ember. And for us, we unfortunately support IE9, so we have like these ugly shims because they don't support HTML5 file reader stuff. Um, so I didn't put any of that into this talk because um, I didn't want to like triple my code base size with just shims. So for the purpose of this talk, it's basically um, IE10 and up, Chrome, Firefox, at least five years old. Um, Safari, I think Safari 6.0 supports it. Safari 5.1, I don't think supports the file reader API stuff, but anything that's really modern. Um, <coughs> so one thing that occurred to me just now is I didn't put an upload button. Uh, I actually just meant for this to be drag and drop, um, but you could easily put an upload button. Uh, so what I wanted to do was to start by just giving kind of a demo of this sample app. And this sample app's out on GitHub. Um, it just uploads files to an S3 bucket. Uh, I tweeted out the link. Um, the link is just my workmanw slash uh upload demo. I'll leave that up for a while, so feel free to play with it later. Um, that's just a public S3 bucket. Feel free to upload as much as you want. Just don't put your home videos in there. I don't need a <laughs> you really big credit card bill. Uh, but storage is cheap anyway. So, uh, so anyways, I'm just going to give an overview of the demo app and then go through some of the basic components of the architecture. Um, so this is pretty simple. Um, I've got a bunch of files from my file system. I can just drag them on. You get a nice little, uh, I don't know what you would call that, an inviting, hey, overlay, please feel free to drop things on there. You can drop them on. <coughs> you can get previews of images. Um, so this guy right here is a, a 20 meg video. We can't do previews of videos. Um, this guy is a 1 meg image. Um, 1 meg is pretty good. I wouldn't go over two megs in terms of generating Im preview images, because basically a preview image right now, if anyone's not familiar with it, um, in HTML5, you're basically converting all those bytes into a base64 string and then inserting that string to the DOM. So those become big blocks of memory if you're not careful. Um, so I just put like a one meg constraint on here. Um, but it's pretty simple. Just drop in some files. You can click upload on an individual asset. You can upload a couple. You can do bulk upload. Hey, there's a bug. Uh, I know. I bet it's uploading it twice, and they're uh, competing for Interesting. success. Yep, that's a bug. I got to lock that down. Um, but the general premise is just uploading files. Um, and so this is just kind of an upload log. You could go over here, and that's the file I uploaded. Another file. Actually, the same files. It's a movie. Um, so. That's basically uh, the app. It's not too fancy. Just let you kind of mock up some general workflow so I can talk about it. Um, so the first thing, when I started looking into this, I went several different routes. And the conclusion I came to was that files suck on the web. <laughs> they still suck. Um, but the nice thing is that you actually have these file models um, that exist in HTML5. Can you guys see that back there? Should I make this probably bigger? In uh, Adam, does anyone know how to do the font bump? All right, awesome. Um, so this, I didn't use any build tools. I wanted to explore Broccoli, actually, and I ran out of time. So this is all just a static file. There's no build tools or anything. So at the very bottom of this HTML file, I just include all these files. Um, so this is the index file, and it's got my two templates. Um, so the first thing I wanted to explain is that the solution I came up with for uploading multiple files was to build an actual model class um, to manage some of that state. And that was sort of the thing that I found as I tried to do it a couple of different ways, I first tried to have the controller be responsible for managing all of these pending uploads and things like that. It just got messy because e each of these had their own different um, statuses and they had their own progresses. And it was 
like I was keeping track of different pieces of state um, asynchronously, and it just got to be a real mess. So I shoved everything in a model, and it really just kind of made sense. So this is a basic model class I have for file uploads. And when you create the model class, you give it an HTML5 um, file handle, which I call file to upload. And um, I have this nice little on init guy down here. And uh, he just goes through and he picks off basic pieces of information from that. Uh, he picks off whether it's an image. Um, he grabs the file name. He grabs the raw size. Uh, he builds a string for human readable size. That should really be in a component. Um, but I ran out of time at the end, so I just put it in that model. <coughs> and then he does the check for one meg. Uh, and I promise I'm not going to walk through all the code line by line, but just wanted to show this kind of part. And then this is where we read the file. And this is one of the many cases where I ran into, when you're trying to upload multiple files, you really just need like a model. And it, it's not probably what uh, the Ember guys would say if they were standing here. They'd probably say to have the view manage part of it and the controller do the upload part of it. Um, I found that to just be too cumbersome when I was implementing it. It would really be nice if Ember Data took care of this, but it doesn't yet. So anyways, so I just read the basic aspects of the file from the file system using the HTML5 API. Um, I have a couple of properties on this guy. And then really, I just do the upload to S3. So the upload, this is just using native um, form data API stuff <coughs> for reading the file from the file system. Um, it puts on some headers that are important for S3 and uh, just does an upload. And it also keeps track of a promise, um, just an upload promise. If you guys are familiar with promises at all, um, it, Ember uses them pretty heavily. The promise is just nice. Um, it's how I know when the, the upload's finished, and it's how I put um, this URL in the DOM after the upload's been finished. Um, so I'll, I'll get back to that in a second. And that's really all the file model is. So it's really just a container. Uh, to keep track of that transient state kind of thing as it's uploading and to keep track of progress. Um, but then the thing that I thought was really cool about this approach in the end was that I basically did it at the router level. So I reopened the route class. <coughs> Excuse me. And uh, I put hooks in for um, activate and deactivate. If you're not familiar with the router or if you're vaguely familiar, um, every router, every logical section of your app has certain workflow hooks. Um, activate is a hook that is called when you enter that route or that logical section of the app. And deactivate is called when you leave that section. And so in this case here, uh, I do an increment and a decrement. And I just keep track of whether or not there's a route or a sub route that can handle files. And that's how I deal with. Um, doing the drag and drop stuff. The premise that I found in our app was that basically 70% of our routes or 70% of our logical application states need to be able to handle upload files. So rather than implementing this stuff all over the place, I implemented it at the router uh, so that it naturally works throughout the app. Um, so if you go into the application, I put a hook on the applications did insert element. And this is what does the fancy overlay and um, this is what is responsible for um, receiving the files when they're dropped. And what it does is it takes those files when they're dropped and it sends them into the router. So whatever state you're in or whatever route or logical part of the application you're at is the one that first gets a chance to handle the, f the drop target. And then it bubbles up naturally. So if you're at a sub route that might be an edit user, <coughs> and it might be maybe even the user's change password screen and it can't handle it, it could bubble up to the part of the route that could handle, say, changing their avatar. Um, so it makes it really easy to just do the same thing you do consistently with the router and its action bubbling, uh, but with file dropping. So it's not a lot of code. This is basically, this is where we send it to the router. Inside of the file, um, the files route, I have this allow file drop. The allow file drop was just a way that I could tell that higher level piece of the router that I implemented um, whether or not it should display that overlay. So if I was in a route that couldn't support file dropping, it wouldn't show that. It would just ignore those events. Let me, uh, let me implement that real quick. I'll call this. Awesome. 
So this is just another part. Uh, this is just a route I made. And this guy here doesn't have the, um, sorry, I'm jumping around. The route declaration doesn't have the allow file drop. So if I try to drop files, it won't, it won't give you any indication. It'll just, it'll eat those events so that you don't lose your page transition. Or, you know, if you're on a site that doesn't have any file drop handling, you drop files and the browser attempts to open them in place. Um, so that was really the focus of my whole implementation was to try to get it to work at the router level so that you could do different things across the app uniformly. Um, that's really all there is. I mean, the rest of this stuff is just like you would expect, kind of boilerplate stuff um, in the sense of I've got a computer property that computes you know, the total um, across all of these files. You, know, you can change the names, et cetera, et cetera. So, I've got a so sure. At, at like a higher level, can you talk about how you're using these uploads? Like when you when you go and you successfully upload this to, to yep. the server, what does the server give you back, and how are you like integrating that with your current model sure. that you already have? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Thank you. That's a really good point. Um, so in our current app, um, we're actually actively working on making inline uploads. But right now we've got this modal dialog. So you drop some files on launches the modal dialog. Um, it lets you edit some different pieces of information, like we have tags and things like that. Um, we submit, and each of those um, returns like the actual JSON payload after we do the AJAX upload. Um, it returns the JSON payload for that, that entity or that uh, model that's now in the database. And after, um, there's a promises thing that they added that lets you coalesce a bunch of promises together. Um, with an array of promises so that after all the promises have been fulfilled, then you can take action. So once all of those upload promises have been fulfilled, we take all of those responses and load them into the store. And then we put those into our controller um, so that they appear to have just uploaded in place. Okay. So your strategy is like to create the model first. Yeah. Get that response from the server. Yes, but it's a different model than, than, the, upload. than the upload. Yeah. It's just a temporary model that's meant to like hold that progress. That was the thing that I really struggled with was the fact that you know you had five like if I click upload all, I have five different guys reporting their progress, and so I needed a place to store those that were in you know compacted with the other information like the uh, the name and the target. In some cases, the target of the upload. So did that answer your question? I kind of got off track. Sorry. Yeah, so it's unfortunately even weirder because we're an app engine. So we have to upload to one point, and then it responds and then bounces us into our direct endpoint, and then we load the data from the database. So in App Engine, they have a high performance image store, and we upload directly to there um, through a fixed endpoint on our domain. And once it's finished, it bounces us over to a certain point, another endpoint on our application. And that guy goes and looks it up in the database. And then he returns the file record for us. So from the client's perspective, it's just one request. But technically speaking, it bounces through two different endpoints. But once it gets that back, yeah, those are separate models. It doesn't have like a real concept of an upload model. It just has a file model. And after we've done the upload, when it bounces us over, it gives us a reference to the ID it just added. It. And then that guy goes and finds that ID and materializes the whole thing for it and then returns that to us. And then we just take that and load that directly into the store. And then that fulfills the promise to the upper level, to the controller, to the, the router, whoever's listening for that. What's up? Uh, so kind of a, a newbie's perspective. Sure. Just kind of uh, what I've been learning about Ember, and especially Ember data, there's this concept of Ember data about adapters. Um, and I'm kind of curious, would this be a candidate maybe for like a S3 type adapter? And That's then, Sorry. Uh, just sort of like a continuation of that question would be like, is there a capability in Ember at this point in time of using multiple adapters in a single application? So. Um, I believe the answer to both those things is yes. Um, somebody correct me if I'm wrong. I'm not the biggest Ember data expert. Um, we've been sort of maintaining our own version for a long time because we have a bunch of custom stuff that they didn't support. And as soon as Ember Data 1.0 comes out, we'll probably move over. But from what I've read, I believe that you can support, you can indicate uh, different models can handle different adapters. Yeah. Um, okay, so you could have in this particular case, if I made this uh, in my code, 
uh, I just made my model just um, an, obj an Ember object for convenience, but I could have as easily made that um, a Ember data model, that still called file upload model, and I could have designated a specific um, adapter to handle that, create action, and then when I actually called commit, he could have underneath the covers just, instead of doing like a standard AJAX post, he could have done an XHR2 file upload post. So that, that's a, actually a really good idea. Um, if I was thinking of that, I would have built on that. That's, yeah, you could do that pretty easily, I think. So how do you then define, like, on the model? Is there, like, a property on the model that tells it what adapter to use? There's a naming it's convention. Yeah. yeah. So if, you, if it's called, like, post model, it would be called post adapter. Oh, okay. Yeah, because, I mean, I, I've always seen the example of, like, Applicate, uh, was it application adapter, I think. Yeah, that's yeah, it. It's just like, oh, that you can yeah. only have one adapter. For your so if there's not one defined for that model, it will fall back on the application okay. adapter. I, I see that a lot in Ember, just like kind of like bubbling up. And mm -hmm. Yeah. Like, the only thing is, like, I don't know if the adapter would like help you in this case. Like, everything is so different. It, I don't know. It'd be interesting to try this with an adapter and see. It would. Be, it would be a good experiment, actually. I think maybe if it I'll, helps you or not. I'll branch that and try food. it. Oh no. What's that? It's a live code. Live code. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I don't know enough about Ember data. It's the new stuff, anyways. They're like live reading through GitHub yeah. pages. <laughs> live people getting frustrated with me and walking out the door. Yeah. <laughs> so I want to talk. I was, I was interested in the shims also. So you go down to IE9. Yeah. So we support IE9. Um, unfortunately, for we're using form data. Right? We're using form data. We basically, so in the file model, um, we have an alternate file model implementation um, that's meant for form data. And this is like really where I'm glad like Yehuda or Tom are not in the room because they would be telling me that's the complete wrong thing to do. And it is because files stink. Uh, but basically what we do is for IE9, um, we have actual raw form elements and somebody actually clicks an input button. They select a file or files, and then we take those form elements and we like rip them out of the DOM and we put them into this file model. So we've got this model with DOM elements in it. Um, and that basically maintains that state. Um, so that you could still, like if this, if this was IE9, for example, um, you would have had an upload button, you wouldn't be able to drag and drop, and you would have selected a bunch of files, and we would go through those input elements and put those input elements into different models, and then that way, you could still do something like this where you would say remove from list. And this at this point would not be the input element. It would have been hidden under the covers. But we take those input elements out and then lose progress. The progress. you lose progress. You lose image preview because you can't do file reading. Um, you don't know the f file's original name. Um, it's presentable, but it's not super intuitive. They give you like a path, not an actual name. They don't give you the file size. It basically goes back to. So we use JSONP, um, and that's another consequence of IE9, single page app, and also App Engine. So it's really kludgy. It's that code makes me squirm just thinking about it because it's we have to we take those form elements and then we post them to the server, but we say the target is this iframe we create, and then that iframe um, once he gets the response of that, he bounces over to another place that serves up HTML code that has JSONP in it, which calls up to the parent iframe to give us the response. It's, it shouldn't work at all. <laughs> like, it goes against everything you would think, like, in terms of, because we also have a cross-origin problem sometimes. Um, some of Google's endpoints can't be under our domain um, for some of their cloud storage stuff. So to complicate all that, we have cores issues. So that makes IE9 even harder. Uh, yeah. yeah, we, a project I'm working on right now, we, we're going down the same path, and we ended up using this jQuery file upload plugin. Yeah. So I, and I, it worked pretty well. Yeah. I mean, it does the cores, or it does the HTML file, and mm -hmm. but it kind of does the shape. Yeah, so I actually sure, looked at that. Sure that was, can't do everything. That was the first implementation um, when we were rewriting it for our, our app, is because I know everybody uses that. And it, you can't even search like HTML5 upload without that plugin coming up. Um, so we looked at it, and the biggest problem we had was the headers. Um, we couldn't really get into the headers, and there's um, when you're really uploading big files, and the reason we did this was to upload videos, videos that some customers are like 800 megs, 900 megs, and so we have this resumable endpoint where we can like read the bytes and say, this is the last place they started, or they stopped on the upload, let's resume reading the bytes from here. 
And so that requires a bunch of custom headers and stuff. And we were just, we ended up, when I first tried it, it worked great for the happy case, like uploading images and stuff. But I found I was just like circumventing it left and right. And so I just kind of took what they did and sort of mirrored that in a place where I had more control of the code. Sure. But, but it's a great, yeah, if you guys are thinking about upload, jQuery file uploader is awesome to get started with. Just don't use all the DOM stuff they do, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Because they try to like insert bootstrap elements. It was really fun. I mean, I just wanted to mention with that also. It was like, at the end of the day, it gave you like a form data object that you could then like try to put that like into a model. Yeah, yeah. It, it, you're right. It, yeah. And it doesn't really give you a lot of control. It's just, it's a big giant shim. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I'll definitely be checking out this code. Yeah, yeah, feel free. I put it up. I tweeted the link, so you don't have to remember this right now. Um, I don't have a lot of public get, uh, repos anyway, so you could probably find it that way too. But uh, yeah, feel free. And like I said, the S3 bucket, you can put your own S3 bucket or you can use mine for a while. I mean, storage is cheap, so it'll probably cost me 10 cents next month. Just don't upload like a lot of stuff. Um, any other questions? Any questions about Ember in general? I know we have a couple of people in the room that are less familiar. What's up? Or anything for this application? Man, that's the question you know I always fear when I do these <laughs> talks. <laughs> it's like um, it's testing, and it's not that I don't have a good uh, posture toward testing. It's that for a long time it's been really hard to test the Ember stuff. And um, I ha have you looked at the Ember um, testing packages at all? Yeah, but I mean I don't, I don't use them. Yeah, it's <laughs> it's hard. I mean, it's the hardest thing about it is that like. You either end up doing like unit tests and you're testing like controller behaviors and you feel like you're like micromanaging your app, or you end up with integration tests that are you know interacting with your DOM a little bit. But they're in our in the case of our app, anyways, they end up to be really brittle because our I mean our app changes a lot and it's not that it's like unstable, but you know we're always making improvements and it feels like gee the test broke again and it's like oh well someone changed the you know that component that test is off and so I wouldn't say we've given up on integration testing our app, but we typically rely more on unit testing. Um, it's so just right, a, this would be like the mother of all integration tests. Like oh my gosh. Everything is against like all these crazy APIs that don't control and it's not yeah. application logic, so like it wouldn't be good. Like you couldn't really unit test. Yeah, you couldn't, you can't, their uh, final APIs are like really tight. You can't, it's not super easy to even like make your own. You like, run in multiple browsers. Yeah, you, you could, average, yeah, it's, yeah, that, that's the issue we really run into a lot. Um, so we try to do good unit testing on like our controllers and certainly on like any computer properties and model computer properties and things like that. But when it comes to like interactions like this, it just it feels like you spend more time writing the test that you spend more time babysitting than you did actually writing the code. So it's a crappy answer. I hate to say that tests suck, but Uh-huh. Yep. I mean, we, we've taken the stance of more doing integration tests just like we would a Rails app, like clicking on buttons and doing stuff, driving everything through the browser, and then unit testing the stuff that needs unit testing to get JavaScript. So what, like, do you find, you know, between, like, the Yeah, that's a good point. Um, that's a good question. Uh, a lot of times what we do is, let me boot up our app and I'll show you our app. I know I've demoed it before. That's our main site. It's on our app. Uh, yeah, yeah, you absolutely could. We used, um, there's one at the DOM level, uh, Dominator, for a while. And those became brittle also. Yeah, I've heard good things about that. Um, so a lot of our, we find that a lot of part of our applications um, are really kind of sort of pieces of other parts. Like this is a selection pattern where you can um, select different components and you can like drag or do something with them. Um, but a lot of different things in our application you can select. And so a lot of times what we do is we build mixins. I don't know if you're familiar with mixins. They're kind of, they kind of make you feel like they're bad pattern after a while. Um, it's basically just like shoving in 
a block of code that's not inherited, but just like you know injected almost. Um, but like these guys suffer from the same patterns. But anyways, we have these mixins that do a lot of common functionality. Like we have a selection mixin, we have a search mixin, um, we have a filter mixin. And so what we do is we really heavily test those because those are where a lot of our behaviors lie. Uh, and those are easy to test because you can easily just make a stub controller with that mixin. Um, uh, it's a there's a lot of there's some languages that are more functional that have mixins. It's not super popular. I don't know. I think Lisp maybe has mixins. Someone on the internet that's going to watch this has is going to includes. I mean, it's yeah. similar to dependency injection. It's like inheritance except it's like multiple inheritance. Yeah, it's like multiple inheritance almost. But um, like I can show you a really primitive example. Um, Emberge. Oops. Let's see. It's almost like just copying the methods onto the other That's basically, that's a really good example. That, that basically just adds another property to the, to the yeah. other score object, I guess. Yeah, I guess it would be doing the same sort of thing. So and I know love the same context. Yeah. And those yeah, are like an underscore you can do extend. Yep, absolutely. Um, awesome. OK, so this pattern here, this is really the mix-in. I, I should probably bump that because you guys probably can't see it in the back. So this is the mix-in. And it basically just takes any of the functions or any of the properties that exist in that mix-in and applies it into this controller. And so it's not part of the inheritance chain per se, even though mix and functions um, do support super behaviors. Um, so you could have several different mixins, and mixins can extend mixins. So you could really think of that as a tree um, of parent patterns. And a lot of people say that it's not good practice, and it probably isn't um, a whole lot of times, because you get, like, an, I could have a third mixin that inherits from another mixin that can have a property conflict. Someone could call selection, and then someone else could have this other thing that calls selection. And not until you start using them downstream do you get these conflicts. So it's not super good pattern. We don't use it. We certainly try not to use too many mixins at once. But um, when we do use them, they're for things that are super common and found on all different pages or all different controllers of our app, such as selection or um, search helping, things like that. So we would take, like, we would have a selection mixin. And we put that selection mixin in the controller, and he would have common actions for selecting, deselecting. He has computer properties that tells you, is everything selected, is nothing selected, um, things of that nature. So we really test those, because those we find have a lot of our behavior. But, but in addition to that, we also test our controllers. Um, components a little bit. We don't really have a lot of components, to be honest. We're still migrating over to them. Um, and then models. Uh, we find that a lot of our models have uh, computer properties, and so we test those pretty good. Absolutely. Add, Absolutely. It's kind of similar to what you've done here, except the mix-in, I guess, is just much more generic. Absolutely. Yep, you're absolutely right. We do that a lot. Um, one example is in our app, um, to split up some of our code. Let me um, blow this up, too. Hopefully, our layout's not going to freak out. Good. Uh, we have one little CSS quirk. Um, we have this other thing. It's, uh, this is for admins only. This is like manage your account. You can create new communities. You can put SSO information in here. This itself is a separate single page app from this. And we have a third and a fourth separate single page app. And so um, co things that are common, like login. We have a base login controller um, that handles doing a lot of the different session things. It could verify your account. It can reset your password for you, things like that. And so we have those up in a base module, as we call it. And each of our individual um, 
single page apps will inherit from those, and they might extend some of the behavior. So it's very common. Anything else? What's that? The mix, the the ones that they all. <coughs> you, usually, they're controllers yeah. diverge on. Yeah, I mean, you could you could technically use them in different cases. Um, Ember internally uses them um, for some things, um, and they kind of take the same approach, really. Like, let me pull open. Like innumerable. Yeah, exactly. Um, there's innumerable mixin. Um, text support is a mixin, um, and they basically do the same kind of thing. Like, they have this text support mixin. And he provides um, basic workflow things that a, both a text field, um, an input element, and a text area, an input body, would exhibit. Um, but they put these on a mix-in. And then later on, when they actually create the input element or the text area, they'll mix those behaviors in. So it's really more, I like to think of it more as behavior driven than any sort of particular usage driven. And that's what we use them for. But yeah, you, you basically. A lot of times we find we mix things into controllers, but sometimes we'll mix them into views or components. Anything else? Awesome. All right. Well, thanks a lot. <laughs>